This week on Personally Speaking, our guest is Rob Astorino. Rob served as county executive of Westchester County. He's running for governor of New York, and he's one of the founders of the Catholic Channel on Sirius XM. Please stay with us. Welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Losanti. New York gubernatorial candidate Rob Astorino joins me now. Rob is a former two-term county executive for Westchester County in New York State. He currently works as a business and media consultant. Rob Astorino helped launch Disney's ESPN Radio in New York, and he was the first program director for the Catholic Channel on Sirius XM. Rob was the Republican nominee for governor of New York in 2014. He's now running in the New York Republican primary for governor. Rob is married to Sheila, and together they are the parents of Sean, Kylie, and Ashlyn. He's here with us today to talk about his life, his career, his family, his faith, and the values that matter the most to him, and why he's running for governor. Joining me now, I'm so pleased to welcome to Personally Speaking, Rob Astorino. Rob, thanks first of all for coming on the show, and let me ask you something. Before you uh, were interested in politics, our listeners and viewers might know or might not know, and this of course is a show that goes out on the Catholic Channel, they might not know that, uh, that you were a king of sports media. So I'm just wondering, how do you go from uh, basically interviewing jocks to interviewing cardinals, the transition to where you took over the Catholic Channel, how did that happen and how did you adjust? Yeah, so good to be with you, Monsignor. We've known each other quite a long time. That's and the I'm, truth. I'm so happy to be on your show. And it was interesting going from interviewing those on the St. Louis Cardinals to yeah. Cardinal Dolan and other Cardinals around the U.S. and world. Uh, but for me, it was an easy transition. You know, Catholicism is something uh, that I live on a daily basis. It's who I am. So, you know, to go back and and do something for and with the church was it was exciting for me. It was a lot of fun. Uh, mm -hmm. I got to interview, you know, Pope Benedict, which I never thought I would. But right. that was, you know, just incredible and i got such a wonderful memory and photo of that day and the catholic channel which lives to this moment you know we flipped the switch in october of 2006 and it was ah. just um an exciting an exciting morning i remember that very well so it really hasn't been a big transition to politics you know you're dealing with people you're you're hopefully standing on your principles and your morals and i think we need a lot more of that in public life these days Rob Astorino is our guest. Rob, you know, many years ago, one of the first interviews I did was with the uh, great film director, Frank Capra, and he said to me, he said, you know, if St. Paul were alive today, he would not be floating around from city to city giving talks. He'd be using popular media. As a guy who has a great history in media and how to use it effectively, what might this church that you and I both love do better in terms of the possible cooperation and use of the media to, to get the message out in a more uh, acceptable and popular way? Uh, that's a great question, and I think we're we've kind of fallen behind on that. We're still mm -hmm. in the uh, I'll be I'll be kind and say we're in the MySpace era <laughs> instead, of, <laughs> instead of Facebook and TikTok and everything. Yeah. And not that I think the Pope should be doing TikToks around um, you know around the Vatican, but I do think there's a way to present Catholicism in. I don't want to say more meaningful way, but in a way that most people can understand. And that was my whole desire and focus on the Catholic Channel when we were starting it. I, I still remember Cardinal Egan uh, interviewed me for this, and I was being interviewed at Sirius XM with the executives. Hmm. And they said, if you could start the Catholic Channel on Sirius XM, how would you program it? And I thought that was a really good question. And I said, look, we have EWTN and we have other options for people to, to do the rosary on the air and, and that's, that's well and good. But I think we need to touch the average normal Catholic who is just busy all the time, yeah. some of whom have fallen away from the church, some of whom go irregularly, you know, Christmas and Easter, mm -hmm. but they're trying to juggle their lives and, and we've got to reach them in a, in a way that they'll understand. And, some of them 
went away from the church for valid reasons, others because, you know, just time got away, whatever. And I love the fact that we have people on the Catholic channel. I say we because I still feel part of the family. Right. But we have people like you and others who can relate to the mm. average, I'll say normal, busy Catholic. Yeah. And that's the way we're going to bring them back. And I would love when I'd hear from people like, you know, I never knew this about the Bible or I never knew this about our church or, you know, I just love to laugh on the air with whomever. And, and it's mm. such a different side of the church instead of the, you know, the finger pointing that some of them might think it's all about or the no, 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 you can't do that. Yeah. That's not what the church is about. So I told them, I said, look, I just want to have good programming. First and foremost, it's got to mm -hmm. be interesting and and that will bring in the listener. And it's got to be what I what I call driveway radio. You know, you, you have a long commute, you pull into your driveway after an hour of work, you're exhausted, you just want to go in the house, change, have dinner and, and plop down on the couch. But yet you're listening to a show and it's so interesting and enjoyable. You wait another 10 minutes in your car to hear the end of it. That's what I wanted. And I think there's a lot of programming on our channel that does that. Yeah. And, and so that was the, the whole meaning of, of starting the Catholic Channel. It's funny you say that, Rob. Just this week, a man stopped me at a wake, and he said, you know, I was driving along, and I'm listening. And then you had Bill O'Reilly on. He said, I'm wondering, you know, what is he going to say about his faith and values and stuff? He said, so I stayed. I parked the car, and I just listened for a while to hear the whole thing, which is what you're saying. Let's grab them. And I've tried to have on this program people who believe, and people who don't believe at all. We had mm -hmm. the uh, Ed Asner, the great actor, who said, uh, I'm a Jewish atheist. And I said, well, at 90, are you still an atheist? And he said, let's just say as I get closer to the end, I hope you people are right. <laughs> I like yeah. that, you know. Now, for those who don't know, Rob Astorino is county executive of Westchester, uh, had to handle administration. And I think, Rob, on the Republican side, you're the only guy running for governor who has the ability to take a large bureaucracy and run it. You've done that in local government, now on a much larger level in New York State. But you look at a state like New York, which is so complex and so huge, how do you bring good administration to corral and, and, uh, and direct large administration needs? It's tough because, mm -hmm. look, I've been in private industry and business. You know, when I worked at Sirius XM, mm -hmm. uh, I worked at Disney for ESPN Radio. We started that in New York. Uh, so I've always been kind of management and on the air and a little bit of everything. And when you're in private industry, it's so much easier. You put a plan together yeah. and you go forward, you know, whatever that means. You invest. Unfortunately, sometimes you, you got to make changes in personnel, whatever. When you're in, in government, everything is a fight. Everything that seems so easy and normal isn't. And so yeah. you've got to really lead. You've got to pull public behind, opinion behind you. You've got to put a plan out there and, and then deal with the other party or your own party. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've got to balance all the needs versus the wants. There's nothing easy about it. But, yeah. you know, when Westchester, which is a very Democratic county, and here I am a conservative Republican, right. Uh, I, I made the case across the board. I, I went, you know, where Republicans don't ordinarily go in the urban areas, uh, in Spanish speaking areas, and I speak Spanish, you know, so I, I wanted to bring the message that we, we need we need change. And, and most people agreed with it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I governed for eight years. And now it's kind of similar in New York. I call this the year and, and in New York, the revenge of the normal people, <laughs> because I just think everything is so out of whack, you know, uh, on all on all levels right now, between crime, uh, between just the cancel culture and being mm -hmm. labeled something if you disagree with a public policy issue and taxes and quality of life, just everything, right? And we went through the pandemic where people sh were, were closed out of society, churches were shut down. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're getting out of this phase or we're in this phase of chaos and just normal people everywhere I go are like, oh, my God, enough is enough. Please mm -hmm. help us. So I, I say this is going to be the revenge of the normal people. And I tell everybody help is on the way, but I got to get there. And if I win, <laughs> and I think I really will, we're going to win this primary on June 28th. But we're also going to win in November because people do want some common sense and balance. And right now, everything is completely out of whack. 
You know, you have a, a great message to give to the people of New York and to the country, but Rob, uh, let me give you an example. We had recently one of the guys you're running against, Lee Zeldin, on, and as he explained his point of view on issues of gun control, uh, it was interesting. My producer, a mom of three, a grandmom, was listening on the side, and as he's explaining uh, what, what I'm sure many people in the Republican base would embrace, uh, she's shaking her head because as a typical suburban mom, she's saying, too much gun violence, what can we do to stop this madness? Um, I understand dedication to the Second Amendment, I do, but uh, we look around and we see the, the, the crazy and the criminal doing terrible yeah. things with guns. Do you have any solution or idea on how we stop the madness? Well, anyone who says we're going to stop the madness um, in its tracks, 100% of the time is lying. That, mm. that is impossible to do. I think you just mentioned, you know, criminals and craziness. Yeah. And that's what we have right now. And, and I want to just reframe it a little bit from gun control to criminal control. Mm. And I put it that way because I'm a gun owner, right? And I had to have a clean record, passed a background check, no right. criminal record in order to get that permit. And that's the case of 100% of gun owners who at the time passed their background checks. Mm -hmm. I do think we've got a mental health crisis in our country. I truly do. I see it even more so with our kids, especially during the pandemic, but with, with all the social media uh, that they're using and, and the violence on TV. We also have a society right now that, you know, in some states here in New York included, where we're coddling criminals, we're coming up with a million excuses why nobody should pay the consequences for their actions. Yeah. We're, we're disregarding those with mental illness, leaving them on the streets or in tent cities or telling them, don't worry about it, you know, here's a safe injection site, have fun. Yeah. Uh, we should be providing services and housing and, and what they need to get better. Yeah. But right now we have a massive criminal element in this society. 75% of gun deaths are suicides. And, and the vast majority of the other deaths are in a concentrated area, in our urban mm -hmm. areas where there's heavy gangs and, um, and criminal activity, drugs. That's, that's the majority of crimes. The ones that get all the attention, obviously, because it's so emotional, are you know the school shootings and those kind mm -hmm. of things. And you do have to have that balance of, of the, the rights of people um, yeah. to protect themselves and their liberties versus what's happening, you know, with, with gun violence. But I think from, from a perspective of somebody who is a gun owner, why am I and others being penalized for the really bad actions of a very few uh, who got through the system either would have passed their background check or obviously the red flags that were there, nobody did anything. Mm -hmm. But things like, you know, I was having a conversation with a mom the other day, you know, about gun-free zones. She says, we need to toughen our gun-free zones. I said, but, but did any of them work? Schools are gun-free zones. The only ones that don't have a gun mm -hmm. are the ones that would actually protect you on the inside. They're not permitted. But any of these shooters, none of them thought for a quick second, oh, yeah. I can't go there, it's a gun-free zone. So I think we've got a, we should have a debate in this country about this, but it becomes very emotional. And right. every time, you know, something happens, it's, we got to do something, but everything that we do and everything that we've done after the past has not worked. Uh, and unfortunately, and you probably know this, you know what charge is dropped almost immediately or reduced significantly when somebody is arrested with an illegal possession of a gun in a crime? What's it's that? the illegal possession of a gun charge oh. that is dropped. So that's significant because we should enforce those laws. We should have even tougher penalties if you get caught with a gun during a crime. But those are the ones that are dropped immediately. So it isn't as easy as everybody thinks. Mm -hmm. um, and there really is a balance between your, your right and, um, and I think including mental health background checks uh, as part of the equation, but that's being forced to, to not happen, too. Yeah. Rob, you know, one of the uh, troubling things that happened after the shooting in Texas was somebody interviewed the mother of the shooter who said, oh, I didn't see any problems. Uh, he didn't seem like that kind of guy. It was amazing to me that a parent wouldn't know yeah. that their, their child was troubled. Uh, getting back to the point which I think a lot of us need to make from the pulpit, that parents and grandparents are responsible. When you're a busy guy, and you're a busy guy in government and private enterprise, how, how much is it possible to 
run a family well when you're so busy and to make sure that those kids of yours, because you're a dad of three, have the kind of values that are healthy and happy? Like, how do you do all that you do and raise a family? You know, that that's a great question. And it's the, the, the one that all moms or, or dads especially mm. uh, deal with. You know, we have three kids, my wife and I. My son just finished his first year of college. Mm. My daughter is in uh, just going into her senior year in high school next year. And my other daughter will be going into eighth grade. So being a parent is the toughest job we have. And it's the most responsible and, and important job that we have. And I have to tell you, there, you know, when you're running for an office like this and you're mm. on the road, or if you're commuting back and forth to work, you know, to doing what you need to do to help your family, that that life family work balance is the most difficult thing because it's it's not where we're sitting around a table anymore or as we should be every night, you know, the five of us or any family. Um, and it's hard because even if you're going to work, you're getting off the train and you're, or you're coming home to the driveway and listening an extra 10 minutes to the Catholic channel. Right. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're mentally spent, but you need to spend time with your kids. And, and I think my mm. wife and I have been able to do that as best we can. Obviously, you know, you're not 100 percent perfect and there are some regrets, uh, but I think so far it's worked out where they're good. But there are times when I'm on Interstate 90, let's say, you know, going from Buffalo to Syracuse in a campaign and it's 10 o'clock at night and my mm -hmm. eyes are closed and I'm just thinking, I want to be home. Yeah. And, and, and that's the hardest part of running for governor or really any office, the time away. Uh, forget the criticisms. I could care less about that junk, but mm -hmm. not being home uh, is, is tough. And then, of course, you know, when the kids get older, um, you know, it's the cats in the cradle, right? Yeah. Where they, they, they're asking for the car keys and they're going out on their own with their boyfriends or girlfriends. And, um, and, and you just want them back on the couch with you. So it's tough. It, it, that is tough. Rob Astorino, former county executive of Westchester, is our guest. He's running for governor of New York. You know, recently, Rob, I had an opportunity to talk to a good friend of mine who's a Protestant pastor. And I said, uh, you know, uh, they talk sometimes about loosening or changing the direction of the Catholic Church, allowing for optional celibacy. Uh, you're married, I told them, and uh, what do you think? Does it make good sense for us as priests to be uh, possibly married? And he said, well, if you find a wife someday, if they allow it, he said, you better find someone who's all in. He said, because if, if you're not on the same team in terms of ministry, it's never going to work. Uh, right. I mentioned that because you're married to Sheila. What did she bring to the marriage and, and why did you choose her to be your partner in life? And is she all in with the kind of life that you lead? She has been all in. She has been unbelievable. And, you know, we in these races, we sat down as a family and she would say, look, dad's thinking of running for this or, you know, as county executive out and the kids were much younger. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to bring them along on the campaign events for my own memories and photos, but just to, to have them experience what their dad is doing and going through. And um, she has been honestly, you know, and we've talked about this recently at dinner, how hard it was for her when the kids were really young mm -hmm. and I was on the train going to work or I was campaigning and, you know, she was emotionally spent. And sometimes I saw it and sometimes I didn't. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, put a little strain on things. But she really understood the importance of what I was doing and what the importance was for me. And so she supported me 100 percent. Rob Astorino is our guest running for governor in New York. Some years ago, Rob, we had uh, Governor you carry on. And uh, while governor, he had called himself pro-choice. But as soon as he got out, he became a great voice for the unborn and called himself pro-life. So I said to him, the obvious question to me in our interviews was, what happened? What changed? Then he said, look, I'm the father of 10. I always knew what was in the womb, he said, and I knew that what we were killing was a baby. He said, but to make it politically, I had to go along sometimes with values that were not my own. In, in being an elective office, have you found much conflict in private conscience versus uh, what is politically maybe advantageous, but is a, a bit of a corruption of the soul. Like, how do you handle that, Rob, when you're in politics and you know what will sell, but at the same time, it's not where you can go personally? On the very big stuff, I don't give in on, on the principle like abortion. Mm. Look, I was told early on, you cannot run for office in New York 
being pro-life. So say you're pro-life personally, but you're pro-choice politically. I said, I can't do that. If they don't <laughs> vote for me, they don't vote for me. That's fine. I'm not running on it per se, but I'm not running from it. And there are those kind of issues. Very recently, after the Buffalo shootings, I was asked my position on capital punishment, which mm -hmm. has changed. And I really grapple with this mm -hmm. because I do consider myself pro-life. Um, however, I do think once you're born, it's free will and there are consequences for your action and somebody who takes the life of someone else um, may, you know, potentially be put to death by the state. So I go back and forth on this issue. I really do have a hard time with it. But on issues like, OK, if we give, you know, $10,000 to this grant program, which I really don't like, but, you know, those kind of things, I don't, that's fine with me. That's just the budget process or political. Right. But on the really big stuff, I, I can't look at myself in the mirror unless I'm being me. Let me ask you, Rob, the um, uh, issue of hope. Um, a lot of people in a parish like mine on Long Island um, look at what's going on in terms of uh, the, the cost of living, uh, taxes, and the crime, and uh, and they're just they've given way to something worse than physical illness, which is discouragement. So I have to ask, as a guy who can do what he can do in public life, and hopefully will get the chance to do more, are you so overwhelmed by all that's wrong, all that needs to be corrected? that you lose hope? Well, how do you keep from being discouraged? I'm not discouraged because I do know that there are a lot of people who are and mm. they want to leave New York or they say, I'm, you know, I just can't deal with it anymore or everything's fixed or nobody yeah. is listening to me. And there's there's validity to that. There's no question. Mm. But I, as I said, not only revenge of the normal people, but <laughs> help is on the way. And I really believe that there are better days ahead. We're in a really bad time in our country. And I'm not just talking economically with inflation and the recession that we're just starting to go in. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about we're at a dangerous crossroads here where there's an element in our country that really hates everything about our country. They hate the Constitution. They hate, they hate our individual rights. They hate the family structure. They hate God in the public square or any they hate part the of police. life. They hate the police. They hate the How police. How do you hate the police? <laughs> the, 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 yes. And this has to be pushed back. This has yeah. to be fought and defeated, obviously. You look around the world at countries that never thought they would go from where they were to where they are today. My wife and I were on our 20th anniversary last year in the Bahamas. We went, to, we went together. So in order to come back to the country, we had to go to a health clinic to get a, a COVID test. Mm -hmm. So we're waiting outside and I'm listening and there's this couple speaking Spanish. So I went over, I introduced myself and um, I said, you know, de donde, de donde es usted, where are you from? And she said, uh, Venezuela. And I said, oh, que pasó en su país? What happened in your country? And she was explaining, you know, we, we, we were educated, we had rights, we owned guns, we had a great education system, you know, uh, life was good and normal. Mm -hmm. And little by little, and then boom, it was all gone. We were yeah. fleeing our own country. They took our rights and guns away. They took over the media. There were bread lines. And I'm sitting there going, wow. But then she said something to me that I'll never forget. She said, but what's happening in your country? Mm. And I'm like, they see it. And there's too many people in our country that don't see it or they see it, but they're not willing to to actively participate in stopping it. That's that's really one of the reasons why I'm running. I don't need these headaches, yeah. um, but I really do think we are on a collision course with communism and socialism. And by the way, they're not hiding it anymore. They're saying, right. yes, we are socialists. Yes, mm -hmm. we do want to take your property and your rights. Yes, you are going to you know, subject yourself to the state basically. So I, I think we are in a battle and we better fight back. I'd like to thank Rob Astorino for being with us. As I mentioned, a former county executive in Westchester County, New York, now running for governor of New York. Um, I hear all the time from people, because I talk to people in politics about the fact that a chairman of parties say it's so hard to get 
quality people to run for office because of these challenging times. So when someone like Rob Astorino comes around, who's talented and gifted and uh, understands the challenges and a moral man says, I want to be in public life, it's, it's a gift, it's a grace. And, and Rob, I just want to encourage you, I, I, I hope that you have great success in public life because we do need people precisely who have your perspective and your willingness to stand against the tide to be countercultural in some way for the sake of what's good and right and frankly what's holy. Thank you for all you're doing and, and thank you for being with us. Monsignor, thank you for the time and good luck with the show and it's so good to talk to you. Same here, Rob. This program is made possible in part and sponsored by Bullion Shark, a leading rare coin dealer. Do you remember the Bible story of the widow's mite? The widow's mite coin is the type of coin that circulated in the Holy Land and is mentioned twice in the Bible. It's now possible to have one of your very own. Bullion Shark, a well-known rare coin dealer, has a limited supply of these biblical coins, and each coin has been professionally certified. You can buy one or more of these rare coins for just $99 each. While supplies last, their number is 1-888-355-1587. And their website is www.bullionsharks.com. This 2,000-year-old unique coin is a piece of biblical history that also makes a perfect gift. Each coin comes with NGC certification to guarantee authenticity and a story card detailing the story behind the piece. You can own a piece of the biblical story that can be passed along to family members for generations to come. Once again, Bullion Shark's number is 1-888-355-1587, and their website is www.bullionsharks.com. What a great opportunity to own or to give as a gift the very coin mentioned in the Bible. Thank you for being with us on our program. If you want to reach me for any reason, I'm at personallyspeakingpodcast at gmail.com. You can also get past episodes of Personally Speaking or even current ones by going to YouTube and searching under Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Please, if you would, hit like and subscribe. I'd also like to remind you that Personally Speaking is on Facebook at Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. We're also now on Instagram at Personally Speaking Podcast. Please share and let others know about Personally Speaking. I'm privileged to serve as host and executive producer, personally speaking. Our producer is Lisa Jandovitz. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you next time, again, on Personally Speaking.